I'm Randy Martin with the Marcus Hart Valve Center at Piedmont Hart here in Atlanta. I'm joined by a good friend and a colleague, Dr. Sunil Mancad from Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Sunil, we've known each other for a long time and um, certainly um, you've made tremendous um, contributions to our world of imaging, especially as it applies to the heart. I wanted to get pick your brain a little bit in this conversation about at the Mayo Clinic and just as you see it in general, where do we stand with imaging, echo, and specifically 3D echo of the mitral valve, and we'll come back to the tricuspid in a second, as it sort of influences how we intervene on mitral valve problems. Absolutely, Randy, and uh, you, you honor me with that compliment because we've learned so much from you. But with the mitral valve now, and especially with transesophageal echo, the 3D imaging is now at the technological point where the, the images are spectacular and it can really show us the an anatomy without any kind of geometric assumptions and you can actually see the pathology. And why is that important? Um, to know exactly what a surgeon needs to do to fix a valve is something that when they got in there, when the heart's empty, can right. sometimes be difficult. But now in real time, before the surgery, you can plan it out, create a road map, and know exactly what to do with the valve. And it also helps us understand that valves that are more difficult to repair, where you're not as confident because of the complexity of the anatomy, maybe waiting for the patient to have a little bit of left ventricular dilatation or more significant uh, symptoms before you operate because it'll turn into be a mitral valve replacement uh, is something to consider. The, the, um, you know, I'm thinking uh, 3D transesophageal echo certainly is, gives uh, really dramatic pictures of the mitral valve. And uh, you're right, it's a surgical, it's a surgical view. Do we have the capabilities now looking at the resolution, I'm thinking about image dropout, artifacts, all those sort of things. Do we have the resolution now to absolutely see what the surgeon needs to see? I think for the mitral valve, pretty close, pretty close. And especially with the technology, you can do multiple beats, uh, breath hold acquire images. You really get tremendous frame rate and volume rate so you can see it. And you know, not only for surgery, but in the cath lab. You know, right. we're, you know we're guiding now the mitral clip mm -hmm. procedure, um, even with an old time procedure like balloon valvuloplasty, to really look at the commissures and see that you have commissural opening after the balloon inflation is really pivotal to know when the interventionalist can stop. And in fact, it's kind of funny, our interventionalists can interpret these 3D images almost as good as our echocardiographers now. It's, that's, it's an interesting point. So I'm, I'm going to come back to that in just a second. So now there's so much, especially with mitral valve repair surgery or interventional techniques, you really need to not only see what the pathology is, but to, to look at things like measurement, leaflet length, annular size, annular dynamics. Are we getting there now where we can do that whole, Absolutely. whole thing? Absolutely. Absolutely. And in fact, um, you know, we published in the past, along with Maurice Serrano at our institution, that in uh, patients with Barlow's type valve or dilated ventricles, late stage mitral regurgitation, the annulus, which is normally saddle shaped, becomes a little bit flattened and this early systolic accentuation of that saddle shape, which could never be seen until you did 3D echo, well, that's lost in those patients. We've also got a recent paper that showed early in less severe forms of degenerative mitral disease when the ventricle is not remodeled, that early systolic accentuation of the saddle shape is preserved. Now, is that important? It might be, especially depending on the surgical technique. Another important thing that 3D echo really alone can tell us are these gaps or commissural kind of indentations. Um, you know, truthfully, we probably shouldn't call them clefts, right. but they're cleft-like indentations. Right. And how important they are, it depends on their length. Um, but it does modify the surgical approach. And depending on the skill of your surgeon, they may or may not be able to pick that up. However, with 3D echo, we can now pick it up, especially when you turn it around and look at it from the left ventricular side, you can see these cleft-like indentations. And if you see them, it modifies the surgical approach. It's one of the reasons that mitral valve repair might fail, or they have to go on a second correct, pump run. Correct. But you tell them about it ahead of time, they look for it, they find it, they fix it, and then you have a good result. It's, it's interesting. Some of the surgeons that I know might argue with you that they can't, they can't recognize it, but I'm, I'm not downplaying that statement. But you're exactly right. I mean, I think that we didn't, I didn't, with doing all the echo I've done and the TEE I've done prior to 3D, I didn't recognize this, these clefts or what are you, the gaps and gaps and the importance of those. What, what, moving under the valve, the subvalvular apparatus, the cordy. I think that we are, are we at the point where we can appreciate 
maybe a shortened, retracted chords to primary chords to P1 or secondary chords? Or I think so. Thing? And you know, with ischemic MR, and once again, the mitra clip, uh, we're part of a clinical trial that sure. you're probably involved with, the COAP study, where we're seeing if this clip is better than optimal medical therapy. You really need to see exactly where the tethering is, where the chordae are, make sure you don't interfere with those chordae, you know, guide the catheters as they go into the heart. And we can see these catheters so much better with 3D echo than we can with 2D. We would see shadowing sometimes with 2D, but you actually see the catheters, you see the tip of the catheter, the direction it takes. So you get a much more uh, better understanding of the underlying geometry that's involved there. So it does help. Well, I, I mean, and you, you guys certainly have been, been leaders in our understanding of the mitral valve and anatomy and all, all that. Let's, let's go to that poor old valve that's forgotten sitting on the, other side, on the other side of the heart called the tricuspid valve. Um, and we see, um, I'm sure you and your practice, and I know I, in, my, in our practice, we're seeing a tremendous number of patients who come in with severe tricuspid regurgitation due to multiple etiologies. What, what does 3D echo tell us about the tricuspid valve? Well, uh, first of all, there's often a lot of dilatation and you just can't see it well by 2D echo unless you do multiple planes. One specific area where it's really impacted our, our care is in the device leads or pacemaker leads. Um, Dr. Roberto Lang, one of the organizers of this fantastic meeting, uh, has recently published nicely showing about a third of the time when we place these leads, they're not ideally placed. They're not in the commissures. Uh, where they don't interfere with the leaflet coaptation, but they're actually impinging on the leaflets. And if you don't recognize that early, uh, you may not be able to correct it, and then it be, may become irreversible, or there's so much change in the right ventricular size that correcting it after the fact doesn't help. Is that something where, are you, are you, am I hearing you saying that when these are put in, pacers or ICDs, that we ought to be doing 3D echo on them? To well, say, that's part of a clinical trial that we're involved with right, right. now to see. We can't, I can't prove that to you just yet. But what Roberto showed is that if you just did the 2D echo, and actually we showed this many years ago, we just can't recognize the mechanism, whether it is from the pacemaker or not, with just 2D transthoracic echo. You need 3D to know if that lead is really impinging on it. Now, you could do TE in the hands of an expert like yourself, get that uh, short axis view, and get a pretty good idea by 2D. But if in the absence of a TE, by transthoracic, it's very difficult to know if that's the case. Final question about the tricuspid, and that's, that's a lot of uh, talk about tricuspid annular size as a determinant for if you're doing a concomitant mitral valve operation or you want to do an isolated tricuspid valve, you need to know what size it is. How do we measure the tricuspid annulus? When in the cardiac cycle do we measure the tricuspid annulus? Yeah, that's annulus? a great point, and uh, because it changes, and obviously, um, really, um, in systole, it's kind of smaller than it is in late diastole. Right. So we would try to measure it in late diastole, and it's interesting, the guidelines tell us to do a single 2D measurement, but what we've seen at this meeting presented beautiful data from Padua, Italy, um, that that's not good at all, and that it's quite a dynamic uh, annulus and that it changes, and you really need 3D to know the true size. Now, I am of a believer that at the time of a mitral valve operation, if you have some TR and the annulus is dilated, you know, with that cutoff of use 35 millimeters or 40 millimeters, the surgeon should probably do something about that tricuspid valve. That remains a little controversial, but first, we as imagers need to accurately measure that right, annulus. Absolutely. And if we're using a single 2D measurement and not at the right time in the cardiac cycle, as you point out, Boy, we're really not giving our patients the best that we can. It, it would seem to me that the 3D TE or a 3D view of the tricuspid valve and annulus is probably going to allow us to do accurate measurements of, and, 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 you know, much more accurate. Absolutely. Than and, you know, Professor Badano and his group have now published on that. And, uh, you know, I'm going to take it back to Mayo Clinic and uh, try to convince our surgeons to do that as well um, for that very reason. Good. Well, listen, you've, you've, as I said, I appreciate you sitting down with us and, and talking. You've certainly had a, a, a been, a, been a, a shining star in our field of echo as it impacts on uh, valvular heart disease. So thanks very much for well, joining us. Well, we followed uh, your uh, leadership in many echo societies and former president of our American Society of Echo and, and actually briefly at Mayo Clinic, if I remember briefly correctly. Briefly at Mayo Clinic. Thank so you. We're, we're honored to, uh, to follow you. in your thanks footsteps. Thanks very much. And thank you all for joining us, and we hope that you'll come back. Uh, we have a lot more interesting discussions for you.